It's funny how my recent discussions lean towards Hollywood needing to create something hopeful for people. A Golden Age Superman or Disney's abandonment of family needing to be reversed were discussed, but I didn't quite get around to what people crave exactly. And then out of nowhere, Netflix decides to crank out a One Piece adaptation with much of these desired values. Now the only question is, does Netflix's One Piece hold up or is this going to be yet another Cowboy Bebop? One Piece follows Luffy, a young and aspirational pirate made out of rubber after eating a fruit, and he seeks the titular One Piece, a treasure owned by the greatest living... <laughs> former pirate Gold Roger, who told people to live free and seek out the One Piece. Whosoever claims it shall be granted the title of Pirate King, and Luffy intends to do just that. However, it won't be easy, because the treasure rests somewhere in the Grand Line, a treacherous band of ocean that few dare to sail. You see, the world of One Piece is like most anime worlds absurd. The world is basically a Pokeball, with two gigantic oceans, themselves cut into two quadrants each by the Grand Line, and a perpendicular strip of land wrapping the whole of the world like a belt. Numerous islands dot the world's oceans, and you either live under the knee of the world government, or are considered a pirate, or outlaw, living a free but dangerous life. And considering the manga has over 106 volumes, Netflix is probably betting on this being a mainstay. The first thing that jumps out are the sets, which remind me of Hook. They're large and practical, which can't be said about 90% of all the CGI bloated crap that comes out today. When compared to absolute shit like the Rings of Power costing an average of $60 million per episode, compared to One Piece's $17.3 million per episode, you can really tell which was handled with actual care for the source material and fans. And being based on an anime, the world has a lot of anime-isms that you just come to accept, like neon signs and electricity, despite most of the sets being shit that also have gas-powered stoves. Also, shell phones and earpieces, which are living snails that people use to communicate wirelessly like someone decided to shove a 5G antenna up Gary's ass. The choreography is give and take. If you're hoping for some Legend of Drunken Master quality fighting, that ain't happening. The choreography can be slower than a marine taking a math test, but it has the style that one would hope for. Zoro has the best fights in the season, and the slow, intentional movements feel reminiscent of old westerns or samurai movies. Other times, the characters just stand there, and they don't do anything until they get yanked by a wire for timing with a CG effect like Luffy's moves. The characters, like the writing, are central to the story. They're fleshed out with unique personalities, traits, and characteristics. Luffy is a naive, inspirational, hopeful, childish, and supportive young man encouraging people to follow their dreams. Zoro is a strong, stoic, and honorable swordsman who loves beer. Each character can be described with an abundance of adjectives, both positive and negative, because these characters have real flaws. On top of this, each character is visually recognizable and almost ripped straight out of the manga from what little I've researched. Luffy, Zoro, Nami, Buggy, Mihawk, and Robbie Rotten, all of them look like they were hired straight out of a convention center. The costume department must have had a lot of fun with this one, because when you see one of these characters on screen, there is no room for confusion. And little details are shown rather than spoken. It doesn't take a grand wizard to figure out why Zoro's white sword is special, and rather than the actor read off a dissertation, we're shown why his best sword means so much to him. It's no wonder this series is well regarded. Someone should gift Disney a subscription so they can take notes lest yet another Star Wars show starring the lumber section of Home Depot be put on screen. The show is surprisingly based as well. Series creator Ichiro Oda apparently maintained control of the creative ideas and kept a close eye on everything, so this is why a lot of things that woke tards won't accept made it through to the final product. For instance, the world government, which is unfortunately a looming reality, and their navy, which is basically their military and police force. They abuse their powers like Hollywood celebrities, and if you don't comply, well, then right to prison you go. This is where Luffy's fundamentals as a character come in, with genuine differences, because he is, at his core, about freedom, which, ironically, the world government disdains. So the political parallel is fitting. Then you have objective and observational truths, like Zoro's friend and rival is a better swordsman than he, based on pure skill alone, which is fine. But she acknowledges in time he'll grow and his innate strength and reach, as well as other physical attributes, will help him overpower her because of a forbidden word whispered only in the darkest corners of public schools today. Puberty. And take Nami, who's scared for her life whenever situations look dire, not necessarily because she's cowardly, but she isn't as strong as those around her and has gotten by primarily because of her skills, knowledge, and wit. And for these reasons, I don't look down on any of them. In fact, I 
I regard them highly because of their honesty and relatable nature. Now, all the general positives aside, there are, of course, issues. This is a faithful anime adaptation, after all, so problems are bound to appear, like acne on a teenager. First things first, the rules are bent as often as Stormy Daniels. Anyone who eats a devil fruit like Luffy or Buggy are sapped of their strength or can't use their abilities after being doused with salt water. Except in the same scene where we are reminded of this rule, the show discards that like a used condom because they both get drenched and can use their abilities. However, different characters state you merely cannot swim or use your powers when submerged. So, take that as you will, but the rules come off as inconsistent to me and only apply when the plot demands. And the information is given across different episodes, so it's unnecessarily confusing. There is also the issue of inconsistent characters like Kuro. The dude is shown to move as fast as Damien from Vampire Diaries if Elena opened her legs, but when it comes to killing the main cast at his mercy, he chokes like the 2000 2006 Chicago Bears. I get he's themed after a cat, but there's a limit. Those are some of the major issues out of the way, but there are little annoyances which don't really interrupt the story, but are noticeable, like the abuse of fisheye lens close-ups. A character leaving or taking an object of importance is fine, but does it need to be distorted like a flat earther trying to prove their lunacy? Also, the editing is sloppy at times. A character like Luffy will do one of his attacks, and the camera will jump back and forth between a close-up, a wide shot, and then a close-up again, and it's just jarring. Not to mention the occasional laziness reminiscent of Witcher blood origin, like Zoro's sword being stolen right out of its sheath as the person he's fighting tumbles down the stairs without it in hand. Then the close-up reveals she had it the whole time. Magically. So there you go, One Piece is a decent attempt to adapt anime faithfully to a live-action setting. I'm not going to gush over One Piece like many others, but I sure as hell ain't gonna tell you to stay away from it either. It's definitely one of the best adaptations out there that brings brings with it plenty of heart and soul with a number of the standard flaws one might expect from an anime, and I'll count it as an apology for Cowboy Bebop. So, if you have the time to kill, then I suggest you give One Piece a shot. And thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.